Good morning and welcome to Veterans Heartbeat on the Pulse of the Veteran, where we discuss issues of health, happiness, opportunity, and well-being of interest to the veteran community, their families, and the community who honors them. Good morning and welcome to another episode of Veterans Heartbeat brought to you by River, the Royal Institute for Veterans Education and Research. My name is Jason Zenkraft. My co-host Ed Lasofsky is here with me and he is the Executive Director of River. We welcome you to a weekly wide-ranging discussion of issues, events, opportunities, and needs in our veteran community. Morning, Ed. How are you doing? Morning, Jason. We'd also like to thank our sponsor, Farside Signs. They create amazing-looking vehicle graphics that will drive traffic to your business. They are located at 1526 South Avenue West in Missoula. Follow them on the web, Instagram, and Facebook, or just stop on by. Well, welcome to Veterans Heartbeat this Saturday morning. We have a very, very special guest, and I'll let her introduce herself. And Lily, why don't you introduce yourself in your native language and then in English, would you please? Yes, um, my name is Lily Tang Williams. I grew up in mainland China and came to the United States in 1988. And Lily, you've got some of your children in the military, is that correct? Yes, I'm very proud to say my oldest son, we have three children, and my oldest son uh, is a Air Force captain. He graduated from the Air Force Academy and got promoted to captain just uh, last May, a few months ago, and uh, is currently stationing in North Dakota. So that's not a very good place to be stationed, trust me. Well, it's his hardship assignment for 15 months, and he he told me actually it's not too bad, and the town is small, very quiet, no traffic. And he's going to go through some special training starting next month. And uh, then he will know his regular shift. He is the third, you know, highest officer there. So it's a good opportunity for him to, you know, test his leadership, I think. Might be good for him. Now, Lily, you're a national speaker on liberty. Is that correct? Yes, I um I mean, I become very concerned for our country, the direction it's going. Uh, when I did a run for office, I found out that people actually responded to my stories, my messages very, very positively. So I decided to take that to national stage, and especially to our young people in colleges who are just as indoctrinated as I was growing up in China. So I got some sponsor to help me funding my trips and. So I travel around the country to give and talk to nonprofit organizations, volunteers at the grassroots level, and the college students. Uh, I mean, that's what I feel passionate and about doing, to tell my stories, how it was like to grow up under a, a communism and socialism, and uh, remind Americans that we don't want to go down that path. So let's get into your story a little bit. Um, I was very fortunate to be at one of your talks last weekend in Fairmont Hot Springs and I, I really enjoyed it and I wanted to invite you on to our show this morning so go ahead and give me your background tell your story well I was born just two years before Mao's uh, great cultural revolution so I went through entire cultural revolution when I was two years old to 12 years old and uh, my parents work for state factories six days a week. We live in a community housing provided by my dad's employer, which is a state steel factory. And I mean, Americans probably have a hard time to imagine, you know, the living conditions we had. And people thought, uh, hey, community housing free sounds nice. But the, uh, the horrible living condition, they, they just could never probably Imagine that we shared the one, one, one um, bathroom for, you know, of course, one for all males, one for all females, a big hole on the ground, one water faucet, uh, and uh, no heating, and mud floor in the winter will grow mushrooms, and I just remember it was extremely cold in Chengdu winter. I was born in Chengdu, Sichuan province, which is the southwest of China. 
and uh, and so that uh, you know, I remember when I was little, I I you know I I had to keep jumping to keep myself warm in schools and home, and then I got a frostbite, got infected. I my left foot still has scar on it. Um, we were dirt poor. I mean, we my parents worked for government six days a week, but we could not have enough food to eat. Everything was uh, rationed. My parents got uh, food rationing coupons from uh, their employers, like a uh, for family of five, um, three children, two adults. Uh, we get a uh, um, food stamps to buy meat and sugar, flour, and rice, and two point two pounds of pork per month for family of five. And then we sometimes run out of rice and flowers, and then. You know, the, you had to just live on rice porridge, which is a little bit of rice cooked with lots of water. You know, you, you swallow that down in within an hour as a child, you feel hungry again. I mean, I just remember my childhood memories is most time it's just hunger. You constantly wanted to look for food to eat. I dream about food. And my uncle told me how to trap the rats to eat. You, you trap rats, you burn on fire and get some meat and bone to chew, but that ran out too. Then we raise our baby bunnies to be bigger bunnies and to, to eat them. As a child, it was very difficult because you raise bunnies and they come, kind of become like your pet. But then you have to watch your families, kill them and make them a meal out of them. And you had to, your stomach was growling, you had to eat them and with tears in your eyes. It was very difficult, uh, um, you know, for, for, for children emotionally. But pretty soon you also could not afford, you know, eat the uh, uh, rabbits anymore. Just like today's people in Venezuela. It's like uh, I, I really feel the pain they're going through really remind me what our life was like, you know, during the um, Mao years. And uh, I had to stay home, babysit my baby brother who was one year old. We could not afford childcare. Everything had uh, charges. It's not like a people's fantasy under communism. Everything is free. Yeah, we had a free housing, but it was horrible living conditions. But when my mom and dad had to pay for school, for tuition, and for childcare. So I had to stay home to babysit in order to save my parents money, not to pay childcare costs for one year old, uh, uh, my baby brother. And uh, I wanted to go to school very badly. I mean, that's why I become very, you know, motivated, top grade student when I went to school at seven years old. I was put back for a year. And uh, you go into school, and then you, you know, every day you had to recite the Chairman Mao's quotations. You had to sing a revolutionary song. You had to chant with his books to say, Long live Chairman Mao, Long live Communist Party. So think about that. You are in public government schools from 7 to 12 until Mao died. So five years, every day you go through motions like that and, and, and uh, it's just total brainwash, you know. When I, when I look back after I woke up in this country, it's like, a, you know, we were really just like a little slave and controlled, brainwashed by the government and total op oppression, total PC, you know, but, but we didn't know it. We were so brainwashed we're supposed to be grateful for what we got. You know, recently, last week, I was at a city council meeting where the councilman um, voted a, almost a 4% increase in property taxes. And some of the reasoning that they were giving was they wanted to pay for water park slides for the kids. They wanted to give free buses or f free bus rides to all the citizens. What does that tell you when you hear the government officials trying to do that kind of stuff? Well, that uh, I think uh, people just truly don't understand that uh, when they use the public good to um, use government power and force to um, tax people, um, well, people have to understand the government is a force. Um, you're not asking for volunteer contributions to your local communities like charity. You are using government to tax people. Guess what? When you don't pay taxes, you get locked up. You go to jail. So government is an inherently, you know, violent um, um, entity. You have to do what they say 
or you go to jail. It's not volunteer participation. I mean, it's like a, I, remember, I, I don't buy that concept. Everything they do is for their public goods. That's just what the Chinese government use all the time. Good for the people, good for the society. So we're going to do this, that, including save your properties, force you to work. And uh, some, uh, I remember some people who were pretty wealthy, that, uh, and they basically were just confiscate their entire properties and make them to work in the field and label them a black class people as people who were rich, who had properties, were not people. They were just like a, um, they, they called a, you know, you exploited the people in the past, so, so that's how you become property owners, you become rich. You know, I grew up with those kind of red ricks, and I just don't believe that because there are so many ways we can better our lives by having a, Truly free market capitalism, where it's colorblind. Everybody who works hard gets a job or start business, have a property rights, a rule of law. Everybody in the society will flourish. And uh, um, but but the government, when they come in to use, oh, we need to provide this that. I don't believe that because the role of government that I had in mind when I choose to come to this country, when I study constitution, the role of government is protect life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. It's not getting into recreation, parks, education, and, uh, you know, people's daily lives. Uh, you know, I'm a very libertarian in heart. I believe the individuals ought to have uh, all those decisions making in their hands, not by your federal government, state government, even local government, because, uh, you know, the rule of government, as I said, is to protect life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. It's not constantly getting involved in every aspect of life in the name of a public good. Their intentions might be good, but uh, look, the intention always, how can we provide health care for everybody until... Now the question even asked by CAN for the people in with Venezuela. Now how you know we're rapid meat meat save people from hunger. Is that's what happens. You know, the, the the road to hell is always paved with good intentions. And I just feel like lots of people in this country don't understand what the socialism is about. And, and uh, why they want to choose socialism over over free market capitalism. So that's why I feel like I have to teach people, tell people about my stories and what they say to us, what they took from us in the name of, you know, public goods and, and security. And then we basically were enslaved all our lives. You know, the city of Missoula has a lot of pride. I don't think that most of the citizens could ever imagine public housing as you described. And one of the issues that I was kind of, chuckling about when you were talking about your uh, housing when you grew up was the bathrooms and how at night you had to really watch out because if you fell over, you fell in the poop. Right. We did not have a private ownership of any sort. I never heard of a private property, private company when I was growing up in China. I, I just did not have that concept. So that, uh, you know, imagine a family share one bathroom so when the night bulb go busted, it just nobody had an incentive to spend a little bit of money to put that new light bulb there. Nobody owns it. So they all have their little flashlight when they go to the bathroom to use the flashlight at night. I did not have one. My family did not have one. So I was so scared to go to the bathroom. That, and, and, and that really smells in the summer. And the box everywhere, worms on the floor everywhere. And you could hear, you know, the, the male bathroom, he just divided it by, uh, by a wood board. So, you know, the bottom is all connected and you can hear each other. There's no privacy. And it just, uh, you know, they, they, I, I have a nightmare still on and off about that bathroom. I was just kind of traumatized because uh, I would try not to drink water, not to go to the bathroom at night. So I don't have to, you know, fall, you know, into the pool, fall backwards, because all you got is two pieces of brakes for you to squat. And you have to try to identify to see where are those two brakes are. And the thing about water, you have one water faucet, so when it's dinner time, you have to line up long line to get water to cook. 
So my dad was a smart handyman. He built a container in our outdoor kitchen. Uh, he's a concrete worker, so he, he used concrete to build a, a water storage tank. So as the oldest child, I would carry a big pot of water every day when nobody is around to fill the water tank up. So we were never run out of water. And uh, the water, of course, is all very cold. So in the winter, when you have to do wash clothes, then we will boil your water, mix with cold water, so you can wash clothes in the winter without soaking your water into a freezing water. Remember, I remember my little hands get really red just because they, you know, very cold, you know, winter with cold water to rinse clothes. And, you know, I mean, that, I mean that's how we lived there from when I was one year old until I was 16 years old. And then we moved to better apartment. But I don't even have a picture of this place where I spent like 16 years of my life. But it's just stuck in my head. You know, I can never just forget about that place. Well, you know, public housing, really, it can be disastrous in this country. Am I, and I know you've seen some of it. Am I right? Right. So how do citizens take back their government. I mean, when the government comes to us and says, I want to increase your taxes by 4%, because for that 4%, we're going to provide a water park, we're going to provide free transportation, and all these other things. And we had over 200 people testifying at city council that this was wrong, and we were getting eyes rolled at us and we were treated like very disrespectfully from our representatives. Well, some politicians in this country, they think they're, be, be, and they're above the regular people. They're have, they have an elitist point of view and they feel like they are right. They justify their actions. They have lots of people cheer for them to provide the good to redistribute the wealth and uh, um, you know it's just it's just amazing to me that you ne they never question themselves why they get elected at the first place you know it's not to redistribute the wealth and it's not to provide lots of things if we don't need a society and um, you know basically from a and cradle to grave all rely on government. You know, there are lots of things people can do for themselves or with each other in the communities on a volunteer basis instead of a turn to convenience of government laws, regulations, because those are basically forced. They force you to be taxed. They force you to, you know, do certain things without choices. And when you don't have a choices at the individual level, you really don't have a freedom. If you don't have a property rights, you really don't have a individual rights in this country. Because I believe self-ownership. The self-ownership, not just your body, but your property, your family, and as parents, you, your children belong to you. But when government come in, get involved with all that stuff, then they feel like they have a power over you to regulate you to death. And by using the name of the public goods and, and give to help the poor, seems like a justify, um, you know, their, their um, means to justify, you know, the ends to justify their means. So they raise your taxes, they give you more regulation. But lots of people care for it. I, that's where I'm just really confused. I think this country never really understand, especially, you know, our um, kids in schools, which is a product of the governmental school education and indoctrination camp, they, 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 they worship stuff like that. They think the government can do so much good by taxing people, by doing this and that, to pass laws. And, and it's like, why do you trust government so much? I, I don't. I've seen a super tyranny government in China, and the one-party dictatorship, I have seen how many, you know, you got 1.4 Chinese people have no rights. Even today, they have economical freedom, property rights now, but they don't have a political freedom. If they become distant, they get locked up and go to jail. And you have seven unelected men who 
are on the political bureau. I mean, basically, seven men who decide the fate of 1.4 billion Chinese people. You know, it just it really bothers me to think that way. It's like, why do those people think they own you? Why do those people think you have no rights? It's like they're just some animals, just us, more superior than others. And the regular people just don't have a voice. And the individuals don't matter. You know, individuals are the smallest minority on earth. People play identity politics, rich against poor, woman, man, you know, and, and the minority this, minority that. You know, now it, you know, there's a big movement to, you know, demonize, the, you know, white man. You know, I hate those identity politics because those just made me feel like a cultural revolution, you know, where Chinese government divided people into 10 classes. You know, five red, five black. Get them to fight among each other. Put so much fear into your head for each other, and uh, divide and conquer. But at the end, it doesn't matter which class you belong to. Even we were red class, good class. We all were enslaved. When government, you know, provide you essential stuff, they also can take away overnight. That's why our rights don't come from government. Our rights come from God, our Creator. You know, nobody can legislate our rights away, when, and we have to keep that in mind and keep pushing back. You know, you make a really good point, because we see a lot of problems right now in the veterans community where we have property rights, we have rights to privacy, we have rights to dignity. And the Veterans Administration, a handful of people at the Veterans Administration, has decided that opiates are bad, benzos are bad, and so they're doing rapid detoxes of, you know, somebody that's been on these drugs for 20 years, boom, you got 30 days to get off them, buddy, and by the way, we're not going to help you. Yeah, it's really a shame to see how our veterans are treated by the bureaucrats, by the politicians. You know, it's like a, they, they, it's like a, they know how what is best for you. They know what is the best medicine pain painter for you. And they know what is the best hospital doctors for you to see. And you have to go see them. You cannot just have choices in free market. And you even don't know what medicine is good for you to kill your pain. You know, you, I, I'm totally opposed to that. You know, you get a politician, the bureaucrats just think that they're above our individual veterans and tell them what they cannot take. I have met lots of veterans who have issues from serving the country, going to the war, and they need a painkiller, they need a medical marijuana, and they need to treat their PTSD by going to see psychologists and psychiatrists and get those necessary, you know, medicines. And, but for some reason, they just don't have that much choices. You know, our defense budget is huge. Why can we allocate, you know, quite a, more of that to help all of our veterans listen to them what they want instead of a centralized decision? Oh, you don't need this out here. You know, you don't need the part to kill your pain, you know, fight your PTSD, calm you down. It's always the people above them. You know, it's such a bureaucratic agency, VA, you know, it's like a, they just make decisions for you. I mean, like our veterans, you know, wait for treatment and dying of waiting. You know, it's like I'm really concerned about this because I have my son who is in military active duty. And then we have family relatives who are veterans. Like what is their future? And I'm very disappointed to hear this. I saw Trump was trying to help veterans. They did try and pass this. The veterans now can go to the other doctors besides they have to go to VA facility. That's a good change, good reform. But the why they just come to decide? They don't need opiate because the war on opiate or whatever, they just take away like that. You have 30 days. It's not fair. It's not a dignified decision to meet our veterans. Not, there's no even respect. You know, it's like a, you would think this is a country based on individual rights, individual freedom. Then why can't you respect individuals' choices? You know, how they made the decision just, you know, amazes me. I, I really don't know how they just come to that conclusion. But it happens all over the country on lots of issues. You know, you don't need to decide. We decide for you because we know what's better for you. Well, it's been a really interesting morning with you, 
I appreciate your time this morning, Lily. And is there anything you want to tell the listeners? Well, if you like my stories, I would like for people to go to my Facebook page, Lily for Liberty, L-I-L-Y number four, Liberty. And I have well, 17,000 followers. I would like to have more. So you can go there, follow me, and share my messages, my stories. And I'm doing what I'm doing because I fear for this country. We will become the country I left. That would be my absolute nightmare to see the free country I came to eventually will go down to the same path my old country, my first country was, become more socialist. Uh, socialist. So I fear for big government. I want to fight to stop the growth of the you know, government at all levels. I hope you veteran listeners can join me and share my messages and to tell people about my story. And thank you for having me. Well, thank you, Lily. It's, it's been an honor. So thank you very much for listening to Veterans Heartbeat. We'd not be able to bring it to you without all the support of the listeners. And thank you again to Farside Signs for sponsoring the show. If you do need a unique vehicle design, swing on by and check them out. Also, thank you to our main sponsor, River. River has an array of services such as veterans-focused education, a vestibular disorder clinic, and now non-pharmaceutical treatments for pain, anxiety, and depression. Check them out on Facebook or on the web at riverofchange.org. Lastly, we'd like to show our appreciation to all of our veterans. Thank you for serving our country and keeping it safe.